Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's the last morning study of this week, and uh, we're going to continue looking at Isaiah 7 and 8 and a little bit of connection with the prophetic mirror. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word, and we invite your presence into our hearts, into our homes, into our lives. We ask for your angels' care and protection. That you can continue to work in our lives, teaching us and helping us. Uh, we pray that as we uh, continue this study, understanding the civil wars and uh, their connection to our time, that uh, you can correct any errors we may have, and that you can shed new light upon this uh, that can help us clearly see where we are today. We pray for one another, pray for people in this movement, our families, and those that we have contact with. We ask that we can reflect your character. And so we again invite your spirit to be here. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> yesterday we looked at Isaiah 7 and 8, and um we know that we have this civil war in 742 BC. So here I just have uh, these dates um, on the prophetic mirror. Now, we have eight dates. That is, we have 742 BC, 723. That's going to be the 19 years uh, from the giving of the prophecy. And then we have 46 years bringing us to 677. That's Manasseh's captivity. 220 years brings us to 457 BC, and then the 2300 years bringing us to 1844. Those two together, the 220 and the 2300, give us 2520. And we also have a 2520 for northern Israel from 723 to 1798. And um, we're saying that this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 even though it's dealing with this end of this civil war that's going to be happening um, and talking about the two kings that the land's going to be forsaken of, um, it's connected to uh, the 2520 for both uh, the North and the South. Now, we also, of course, have the events in Adventist history, 1844, the end of the 2520 for Judah. And then 1863, the extra 19 years on the end, um, bringing us to the Civil War in American history. So we have in this prophetic mirror this connection between um, these 2520s. Now, the reason why I bring this chart up, because normally I have this other chart. Uh, the other chart is... Um, uh, Oops, here we go, there. So the seven times prophetic mirror. Now, normally when we look at this chart, one thing we'll see is there is no 457 BC on it. That is, it's not it's not placed there. The, the division of the 2520 for Judah, we generally don't mark. But, but it is part of the structure, just as much as 538 is uh, part of the structure for the 2520 for Northern Israel. So the 2520 for Judah, Northern Israel is divided into two 1260s. The 2520 for Judah is divided into 220 and 2300. Right. So you have the first part dealing with literal Israel commencing the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks is then going to uh, give you uh, the transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. And, and that's the only reason that the 2300 days can then uh, be fulfilled by spiritual Israel rather than literal Israel. So those who are preterists who just want everything to be about literal Israel in the time in which the prophecies are given or some time close to that, um, they don't see this transition from literal to spiritual as any, having any significance upon prophecy. So that is all the prophecies are for literal Israel and then 
You just have the end of literal Israel, and then there's no prophecies, no time prophecies or anything regarding what's going to happen later. We're just on a, a waiting time for Christ to return. Then you have the futurists. The futurists are going to, to not have an end of ancient Israel. They're going to have this period they call the times of the Gentiles, in which, you know, after the stoning of Stephen or the destruction of Jerusalem or whatever, the Jews are no more a part of, of, of what's happening. There's this period of time in which God has to save the Gentiles. And then after the Gentiles uh, get uh, translated and, you know, brought up to heaven in the secret rapture, then the Jews have to go through uh, some kind of experience where they're going to be, uh, have to accept the Messiah in some ways. And that these events in modern Israeli history, uh, 1848, 1867, or not 1848, 1948 and 1967, the Seven Days War, and of course, when they become uh, a nation again, these become prophetic symbols where we don't take them as having anything to do with prophecy, time prophecy, or otherwise. Um, they're not. They're not. The, the blessings and the curses curses no longer apply to literal Israel. They apply to spiritual Israel. So, so we can see then how this civil war in which the North is Confederate, the kingship's broken, it's not a people, not established, and it's addressing literal Israel and the literal land of Israel, that uh, this in our time, we see this prophecy is hidden on the 1863 charts. The Civil War, it's a mirror, right? So the South is now Confederate. Uh, the kingship is restored. They become a denominated people. The SDA church is established. It's dealing with spiritual Israel and the spiritual land of Israel, the USA. So, so these become, uh, this prophetic mirror becomes extremely important in understanding, um, how we can take these prophecies that are in the time of literal Israel, in this case, northern Israel and Judah in the civil war, and how we can connect them to our time. So this prophetic mirror has been a key um, really from the beginning, even if you, you think about uh, Millerite history, the 2520 for Judah, they did have some understanding of the 2520 for Northern Israel. They just never put it together. And then obviously Hiram Edson he says, well, maybe the 2520 for Judah is not the correct one. We should just look at the one for Israel. But we know that both are true. And um, so these dates that they give us, these dates, um, is here you see the seven dates. And then when we deal with um, this other one here, there we go. this one here, to show first... <clears throat> We can see that there's eight dates. That is 457 is a part of this. Now, um, now why is this division of the 2520 into 220 and 2300 necessary? It's kind of an odd question, but why does it have to be split up in this way? Now, we know we don't divide it into two 1260s like we did with northern Israel. Isn't this a symbol of restoration combined with a, a symbol so that people would understand that the time frame that remained was going to be important for them to pay attention with? Okay, yeah. Now, the one thing I didn't put on here, too, is we don't have the 70 weeks on here, right? And in, in some ways, you know, probably we should, though it, it doesn't fit into uh, the prophetic mere probability. That is, all of these dates here, 742, 723, 677, 457, 538, 1798, 1888, 1844, pardon me, and 1863, each one of these um years on the biblical calendar have a characteristic that doesn't occur um 
as often as other characteristics, and that is you have an embolism. So you're going to have an embolismic year uh, preceding the first day of the first month for each of these years. So that each of these years contain, prior to the first day of the first month, a 13th month. And that happens every, um, you know, well, it happens uh, seven times in a 19-year period, right? So in every every 19 years, you're going to have seven years that have an embolism, right? But if you're going to have these eight dates on here, and all of them are going to have uh, this embolism, uh, the chances of this occurring randomly, if you just took eight random years, you know, spread them apart and just say, okay, I'm going to pick eight years, and and they're all going to have this embolism, it's something like one in, I can't remember, it's a few thousand, like 3,000, something like that, one in 3,000 times that you would have to pick eight years and they could have this characteristic. But they even have another characteristic. And that characteristic is that when you have the embolism, it's within, um, because you could have an embolismic year where uh, you have this range. So, so if you think about how this works, just try to visualize this. You have 30 days in a month. And um, so when you're going to go out and um, uh, when you're going to uh, start a year, um, it's not always going to be really close to, because you're going to look for the new moon, right? So you're going to go out and you're going to look for the new moon uh, to start the year. And uh, so you're going to go out on, the 29th day of, of the 12th month. And, and that new moon is going to have a relationship. It's either going to be before the equinox or after the equinox. Now, if the new moon happens before the equinox, then you have to add an extra month, right? Now, that new moon can happen before the equinox, well, you know, it could happen um, a month before the equinox almost, right? That is, um, uh, you know, it's that, that equinox or it could, well, I guess we would say maybe 15 days before the equinox or 15 days after. But you have a month in there. But all of these are right next to the equinox, each one of these years has this characteristic that the new moon is spotted within a day of the equinox. And that means it's going to happen a day before the equinox. So that means you have to, if it, if it came one day later, the, the, the visible crescent, the new moon, then you wouldn't have added a 13th month. Right. So the chances of this happening, this is like one in seven billion, that you could pick eight dates and you're going to have this characteristic that they're, they're, all of those years are going to have an embolism preceding the first day of the first month, the 13th month, and they're within a day um, of, of that happening. So that means that that new moon has to be seen prior to the equinox, so you add the 13th month, and it's within a day. So it's a very rare characteristic to have eight dates that have that characteristic. That's extremely unlikely, right? So so, so we have this prophetic mirror. Now, why do I bring this up, this probability? So we know that this prophetic mirror that we have is something that's unlikely. The unlikeliness that we could have this 65-year prophecy is 1946, and that it's going to fit into Millerite history in this way, very unlikely, right? That the church is going to form in 1863, um, and you have the Civil War in 742, it's unlikely. And, and that was why a lot of people in this movement 
join the movement is there is this prophetic mirror of these two 2520s. They're extremely convincing when you look at them. You look at them and you say, well, here is something that fits what we understand already. And um, it's it's not likely. Now, some people would examine these things and, and they would decide, well, we can't support 742 as the Civil War, right? Because they look at Thiel's chronology and they say, well, you know, old chronologists used to have that, but we've corrected it. You know, there was some mistakes made by Usher and we don't accept Usher's chronology. And then 723, same thing. People say, well, we can't support that, you know, and I know when I came into the movement, it was always about Samaria falling in 723, and that doesn't happen. That's 721. So it's actually Hoshea's captivity, which is why it's important that we understand when the land is forsaken of both her kings, that this begins the 22520s, not the destruction of Samaria in 721. Now, of course, we could find Edwin Thiel has the destruction of Samaria in 723, and, and I would see people in this movement use that date, probably because they found it in Edward Thiel. And then we have 677, of course, the captivity of Manasseh, the only year ever given for the captivity of Manasseh. That is, you will not find people saying Manasseh was taken captive in some other year, right? And giving a date. They might say he was, you know, the left Leaser or something like that. You know, they're going to have some king of Assyria in which they think that Manasseh was taken captive, but they have no definite date for it, right? We don't know when Manasseh was taken captive is what they'll say. And they'll say he definitely was not taken captive in 677, even though all the evidence shows that he was. Now, so the 220 years going to 457, as Dwight pointed out, is this, Restoration. It's a symbol of restoration. But this is all about literal Israel, right? So literal Israel, the seven times are going to begin with Manasseh's captivity and then Daniel's captivity. So we have here within this, we have this seven times fulfilled by literal Israel. And um, so I'm going to modify this a little bit. Thanks to it some stuff from this one. just want to add these things here to this chart. So, so do something like that. So here we have the seven times fulfilled by little, literal Israel. Now, they're not just fulfilled in the sense of their commencement, but also they're fulfilled in the whole period of their duration. So, you know, there's 70 years um, from, from, from Manasseh's captivity to Daniel's captivity. And then there's periods of 70 years and 140 years from Jehoiachin's captivity to 457, two times 70. And then 70 years from the temple, 586 to 516. So, so the seven times are fulfilled by literal Israel and, and they become a type, right? So one of the things that we're understanding here in, in making these applications, of these civil wars is that we can clearly see that what happens to literal Israel becomes a type of what happens to spiritual Israel. Now, in this case, the seven times, the symbol of seven, is going to be marked as periods of 25, 20 years, that it's going to be seven times 360. Now, we know that because of Daniel chapter uh, 7, verse 25, and Daniel 12, verse 7. So when it talks about a times, times, and a half, it's three and a half times. We know that we can put those two 1260s together to get 2520. So one of the things that we can see is for the critics of the 2520 who argue you can't just say the times in Leviticus 26 is multiplied by seven because the word times doesn't really exist. It doesn't say years or anything like that. It just says, I will prolong to punish you seven for your sins. It doesn't say seven times, right? 
But we know in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 12, it's going to use a word for times. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, um, so I'm going to go here. So just hang on, I'll get this all switched over. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, now, some of you may know this, um, but the book of Daniel is written in which languages? What languages is it written in? Hebrew and Chaldean. Okay. It's going to be written in Hebrew and Chaldean. Now, chapter 7, is it written in Hebrew or Chaldean? Another thing we call it is Aramaic. It's written in Hebrew. Okay, so chapter 7 is written in Aramaic, okay? So, and I had to check that. But if you look at the words here and you click on them, see how it says Aramaic up here? Make that bigger. See, Aramaic? Correct. These are Aramaic. Now, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, because Aramaic is related to Hebrew, but it's it's actually quite a bit different in some of its vocabulary. It's, some of it's similar, some of it's different. Uh, now, why is chapter 7 written in Aramaic? Because remember, he's you can see why chapter 5 is written in Aramaic. Why is it written in Aramaic? Right, see that? There's chapter 5. Or, or chapter four. Why is chapter four written in Aramaic? Not all of chapter four is written in Aramaic. Okay, not all of it. Which part is not? Testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, that's written in Aramaic, right? So you can see here. Um, uh, so now I would just say the part that isn't is the writing on the wall, but, um, Otherwise, it's all written in Aramaic. Okay, so, so, now chapter eight is written in Hebrew, right? So if you go to chapter eight, you'll see it's written in Hebrew. Uh, chapter one, that's going to be written in Hebrew, right? Chapter two, you're going to see some stuff is in Arabic. So it says, then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. Right. That's going to be Chaldean or Aramaic. Right. And and then you're going to see it, it says here, it says Syriac. And in the Hebrew, it says Aramit, Aramot, which is just the land of Aram. Right. Which is the land of Syria. Right? So this is a, a Syrian language. Um, right. And then. You're going to see that then from then on it's in Aramaic. Okay, so you can see before that, as soon as they start speaking in Aramaic, then it's going to be in Aramaic. So chapter two is in Aramaic. Chapter three is in Aramaic. Chapter four is in Aramaic. Chapter five is in Aramaic. And chapter six is also in Aramaic. Chapter seven is in Aramaic. Um, in chapter eight. In chapter five, if we uh, deal with the writing on the wall, that's the only place we're going to have Hebrew. And I think the reason is that they don't, um, they say it's Aramaic here, but my understanding is this is it should actually be Hebrew. The reason they don't understand it is that it's, um, it's not in, uh, not in the language they understand. That's my understanding, but it could be wrong. Um, okay. So, so it's written in Aramaic because why? What does that tell us that it's written in Aramaic? I mean, there's some practical things. One is it actually lends credence to that the book of Daniel was written when it said it was written. Okay. Uh, but we're going to see chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Those are all going to be in Hebrew. Any any symbolic reason? So if it's written in a language other than Hebrew, uh, who's the message to? Other than Hebrews. Yeah. So so it, it has this 
this universal message. It's using the universal language. You know, it'd be like all of a sudden writing in English, you know, the language that's the most commonly known. So parts of Daniel are going to be written in Aramaic. So there's a symbolism there attaching to its universality. Even though it's addressing literal Israel and prophecies regarding them, we have the king of Babylon, this world empire. And so, so that, so all of those first chapters, other than the, the first chapter and a little bit of the second are in Hebrew, then it's all written in Aramaic. And then you have it back into Hebrew again when you get to chapter eight. Now, chapter eights are going to be specifically prophecy um, that's related to um, time prophecy at the end of the world. Right. But it's it's something for the Jews to understand about the coming Messiah, where the other ones are about the kingdoms of the world, uh, particularly Babylon. Here we don't have Babylon as part of this. Right? You're not going to see Babylon mentioned in chapter eight. It's not part of the, the prophecy in chapter nine, 10, 11 or 12. To chapter 10, it's just basically at the fall of Babylon, but it's going to be more about Persia. Right. And then, of course, um, you know, then it's going to go through the different kingdoms in chapter 11. So Greece and well, Medo Persia, right? Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, right? Et cetera. So all of those things are going to be addressed. Now, so this prophetic mirror that we see in uh, Daniel chapter seven, we're going to have a time, times and a half. And we know in Daniel 7, verse 25, uh, when we look up the word times, time, time, times, and the dividing of times, it's going to be this uh, Hebrew number 5732, right? And it's going to be this Aramaic word, idan, which means time, a time of duration, a year, right? Now, it corresponds to uh, uh, another word, um, Ayid, Ayid, which uh, means a uh, set period. Uh, so different, different things that it can be referred to sometimes the monthly cycle. Okay. But, but that's the, the Aramaic word. Okay. When we go to Daniel chapter 12, verse seven, uh, you're going to see that it's going to be, uh, a times, time and a half. And this word times is moed. Now, what's Moed commonly used for? Kind of can see it there. So a Moed is an appointed place, an appointed time of meeting. So it's going to, the feasts are referred to as Moeds, right? So if we think about a Moed as being a year, is that normally how we would describe a year? Like normally the word year would be uh, Shana. Years would be Shanaim, right? Hashanaim, you know, Rosh Hashanaim, Rosh Hashana. The beginning of the year, Shana or Shanim, if it's years. So why are, why do we take this for a time, times and a half and apply it to years and then apply a day for a year? Why do we do that? Aren't we recognizing the appointed prophetic times? Okay, so they're appointed times, right. So we're, we're applying them here in the sense that these are the yearly cycle of the Jewish calendar, right? Especially since we know that the 2300 days is going to be addressing of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is a moed, right? If you go to chapter 8, um, and you read through this, it's going to talk about, um, uh, in the interpretation, um, time and vision. Okay, here it is. Um, he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be the last in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Now, the last end of the indignation means there's a first end of the indignation. 
And the first end is the daily, and the last end is the transgression of desolation, right? So he wants to know, the angels, Gabriel's going to show him, what will be at the last end of the indignation. So that's 1798, right? The last end of the indignation. 538. For at the time appointed, so that's the Moed, right? You can see this here. It's Moed, right? That's the word that's translated as time appointed. The end shall be, um, that's the extremity. So we're going to see that 1798 is the last end of the indignation, but it's pointing in that period of time to the Day of Atonement, because the Day of Atonement is the time appointed, which is going to begin October 22nd, 1844. So even though Daniel is addressing prophecy that relates to literal Israel, to Leviticus 26, to the end of the prophetic periods as they understand it in relation to ancient Israel, that period of 220 years in which this seven times is fulfilled, we also have this prophecy that extends past the 70 weeks, even in a sense past the 2300 days, because it's a prophetic mirror that's going to extend to 1863. Now, in a technical sense, we could say the time prophecies themselves end in 1844. But the prophetic mirror ends in 1863. And that begins in Isaiah chapter 7, as we see. Now, I, I want to point out something here as well. So I know I'm dealing with lots of review here and details that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're familiar with some of them, but some of them we are not as familiar with as we should be. Um, uh, here's This is what I want. Now, this is a section from Miller's memoir that we're going to look at. And I'll just share the screen. Now, this is uh, William's mel uh, memoir by Bliss. And you, we should be fulfill, uh, familiar with this statement because it's quoted in the Spirit of Prophecy. And I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to ask some questions about it. Another kind of evidence that vitally affected my mind was the chronology of the scriptures. I found, on pursuing the study of the Bible, various chronological periods extending, according to my understanding of them, to the coming of the Savior. I found that predicted events, uh, which had been fulfilled in the past, often incurred within a given time, the 120 years to the flood seven days that were to precede it with 40 days of predicted rain, the 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's seed, um, the three, and three days of the butler's and baker's dreams, the seven years of Pharaoh, the 40 years in the wilderness, the three and a half years of famine, uh, the 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim, so that's Isaiah 7 verse 8, the 70 years captivity, Nebuchadnezzar seven times, and the seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the one week, making 70 weeks, determined upon the Jews. The events limited by these times were all once only a matter of prophecy and were fulfilled in accordance with the predictions. So then, uh, when therefore I found the 2300 prophetic days, etc. So he's going to talk about the 2300 prophetic days, the seven times continuance of the dispersion of God's people, the 1335 prophetic Years of Daniel standing in his lot, prophetic days of Daniel standing in his lot, all evidently extending to the advent with other prophetical periods. I could but regard them as the times before appointed, which God had revealed unto his servants, the prophets. Now, we're going to read Ellen White quoting this. I'll go over there. And this is uh, in the Great Controversy 232. 323, 323. Uh, so if I go to the Great Controversy, it's in this chapter, the American Reformer. So you're going to see the same 
passage quoted, but it's going to be different. Okay, another evidence that vitally affected my mind, he says, talking about Miller, was the chronology of the scriptures. I found that predicted events, which had been fulfilled in the past, often occurred within a given time. The 120 years of the flood, the seven days that were to precede it, with 40 days of predicted rain, the 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's seed, the three days of the butler and baker's dreams, the seven years of Pharaoh's, the 40 years in the wilderness, the three and a half years of famine, the 70 years captivity, Nebuchadnezzar seven times, and the seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the one week, making 70 weeks to turn upon the Jews. The events limited by these times were all once only a matter of prophecy and were fulfilled in accordance with the predictions. So what's missing? What's different about this? Now, this is in the 1888 Great Controversy. And just so in, in this one, uh, the 1911. So what's missing from this quote? This one puts ellipses, ellipses in there so you can, you can see where it's taken out of anybody know okay where's the 65 years and why is it taken out so that 65 years of isaiah 7 verse 8 is not in this quote why so she's quoting from Melissa's book the memoirs of william miller page 74 75 because it would it would give the Credence to the fact that seven times of Leviticus 26 is also a prophetic period. Okay. Um, I don't think that's the reason why it's not there. Because okay. if you look at the quote, um, is it correct? That's the question I, I would ask. Here it says, um, the 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim. Is that correct? Is it 65 years to the breaking of Ephraim? Yes. No, it's 19 years to the breaking of Ephraim. But this is taking the entirety of the period as being interrelated to all of Israel. So I would say that it has to be correct. Okay. But Ephraim's broken in 19 years. Correct. And and so... The 65 years is not about to the breaking of Ephraim. It's about to the captivity of Manasseh. Now, Miller uh, did not fully understand uh, the 65 years, right? He didn't understand it was broken into 19 and 46 years. But also, he marked the breaking of Ephraim as occurring in 677, because he understood the breaking of Ephraim to be when uh, the Samaritans repopulated the land of, of northern Israel uh, by uh, Esser Hayden. So when Esser Hayden brought um, these different people from all these different nations, he had control over and, and repopulated northern Israel with them. Uh, he's going to mark that as the breaking of Ephraim. But really, if it said 65 years to the captivity of Manasseh, that would have been better. Right. So Ellen White excises this from her quote. And, and there doesn't appear to be any reason why. So so there could be two reasons. One is she could just not accept this at all. Right. It's it's false prophecy or something like that, which isn't very likely. Um, because you got the great controversy written in 1888, uh, but she takes it out. And it tells us something. Her taking it out tells us something about this prophecy. <clears throat> so either it would be just that it, she takes it out because it's error. But one of the things we'll see is that um, they also have 400 years to, of the sojourn of Abraham's seed. Now, of course, in a sense, that's technically not correct. The sojourn is 430 years, but there is a 400 years period of affliction, right? That is, they shall be afflicted 400 years. And you can say, well, Ellen White didn't take this out or correct this, but she chose to remove this. 
And so there has to be a reason. Now, it could be that she's trying to hide it, but I don't really accept that explanation. You know, we have to, we have to, we have to recognize she does take it out for a reason because there's no reason to just take it out, you know, for saving space or anything like that. And, and there's lots of other details in here. She, she could have just, you know, listed a couple and then we could say, well, you know, she took out a few other ones. You're just being, you know, short trying to be brief. Now, also when we look at the next part of the quote, so here, when I therefore found the 2300 prophetic days, which were to mark the length of the vision from Persian to the end of the fourth kingdom, the seven times continuance of the dispersion of God's people, and the 1330, 1335 prophetic days to the standing of Daniel in his lot, all evidently extending to the advent with other prophetical periods. Um, I could but regard them as the times before appointed, which God had revealed unto his servants, the prophets. Now, when we look at um, Ellen White's quote on this, um, right, she's going to say, when therefore I found in his study, wherefore he found in his study of the Bible, various chronological periods that according to his understanding of them, extended to the second coming of Christ, he could not but regard them as the times before appointed, which God had revealed unto his servants. Now, we know these various chronological periods that he understood that came to the second coming of Christ. But these are three of them, the 2300, the 2520, and the 1335, right? That's, that's when she's saying various chronological periods, he says, right. I found in the Bible these various chronological periods, and he lists them. She's referring to those three periods. Okay. Then she says about that, the students of God's word, uh, this is, um, right, so she's, she's going to say, the students of God's word may then confidently expect to find the most stupendous event to take place in human history, clearly pointed out in the scriptures of truth. And then she says, as I was, she quotes Miller again, as I was fully convinced, said Miller, that all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and then she's going to go on and she's going to say the prophecy, which seemed most clearly to reveal the time of the second advent was that of Daniel 8, 14. Uh, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Following his rule of making scripture its own interpreter, Miller learned that a day in symbolic prophecy represents a year. He saw the period of 2,300 prophetic days, or literal years, would extend far beyond the close of the Jewish dispensation. Hence, it could not refer to the sanctuary of that dispensation. Miller accepted the generally received view in the Christian age, the earth is the sanctuary. And he therefore understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary foretold in Daniel 8.14 represented the purification of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. Right. So she's just going to go through Miller's reasoning and understanding of these things. Now, um, but the point that I want to bring up is still, again, going back to these 65 years. So Ellen White is endorsing these prophetic periods. Right. In, and how she's writing this, but it is in a concealed manner. Right. Right. She could have said she could have just mentioned the twenty five, twenty seven times. She could have just quoted him uh, word for word. In this section. But she doesn't. OK. Because she quotes him. In the other part, except she takes out the 65 years, right? And then she's going to quote him here, but just say the various chronological periods rather than listing them as we get uh, when we look at um, uh, this one where it says, I found instead of, he doesn't say various chronological periods, I found the 2300 prophetic days, seven times in the 1335. She just says various chronological periods. 
all evidently in his understanding extended with other prophetical periods to the second coming of Christ, right? So she's basically saying the same thing. She just takes these three and calls them various chronological periods. So how do we take that? So she's going to, she's going to excise the reference to the 65 year prophecy, which we're studying. And she's going to just say various chronological periods for the three periods that we all accept as valid periods. So is it just that she's hiding this? Is it just that it's hidden since 1863? It's hidden on the 1840, 1863 chart. And so um, she's not going to mention it clearly. Or is there a problem? You know, and you could say, well, the three within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And you could say, well, the 65 years for the breaking of Ephraim. You know, that seems like what it's talking about. But we know it's not 65 years to the breaking of Eve. So any thoughts on this? Because we have this prophecy that we have that starts the 2520. And um, when you look on the 1843 chart, you see over here, it's going to be talking about, so we got Israel carried captive, Second Chronicles 33, verse 11. So you got Second Chronicles 33, verse 11. That's what it's going to say. And it's going to give 677 BC. How do we address this? How do we understand the connection between what's happening in Isaiah chapter 7, 742, and the prophetic periods that end in Millerite history? What is Ellen White saying about them or not saying? Any thoughts? Is this tarrying for us to be able to understand it at this time and be able to apply it within our, our current time? Okay, so that, that we need to understand it now. So the one thing I do believe is that the 2520 was hidden on the 1863 chart, specifically the prophetic mirror, right? That is, uh, when we look at the... Uh, the 1863 chart, it's going to have this week of Christ in it, right? And this week of Christ um, on the 1863 chart, I'm just going to show it to you here. Okay. So in this week of Christ, we can see we have the one week. We got the three and a half and the three and a half. And so that is the 2520 for Northern Israel, right? That is, it is a counterfeit. Okay. What I call the covenant, the satanic covenant week, where they counterfeit Christ's work. That is, paganism and papalism are both counterfeits. One's the counterfeit of the earthly, which Christ ministers on earth for three and a half years. And the other's the counterfeit of the heavenly. Christ ministers in heaven for three and a half years. And that's the week of Christ, the one week. So we can see that this, this illustrates a 2520, right? 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days times two, 2520. But we also note that, um, uh, there is some symbols here regarding this. So we know that even though it doesn't put 31 AD, it just puts the cross, we have 31 AD. Now, on the 1840 chart, they have a calculation for the 2520. It's 7 times 12 is 84 times 30 is 2520. Now, this is an odd calculation to calculate the 2520. Notice it's not 7 times 36 or, or 360, right? It's going to be 7 times 12, which is 84, times 30. That is, they're going to multiply 84 months. Now, we know 1,260 days or times times and a half is 42 months. And so you can see that's 84 months, right? Times 30 gives you 2520. But in this week of Christ, 
we can see we have 31. That is, the cross is in 31 AD. And so if you take the 84 months and you multiply it by 31, you get the entire length of the prophetic mirror at 2,604. Um, I know Tanya thought this was an abomination for me to uh, create this little chart, but I just thought it looked neat. And you could see that I'm taking this calculation from the 1843 chart and putting a 1 AD in there. So it's the seven weeks times the number of the covenant. So seven is the symbol of the, the week. Twelve is the symbol of the covenant. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. That gives you 84. And in the midst of the week, 31 AD, he shall confirm the covenant, right? Messiah shall be cut off. And so that gives us that entire length of the prophetic mirror. Right, 2,604 years. So it's really just a 2520 plus 84. That is, the 84 is the 65 plus 19 gives you 84. Right, so even though you have 19, 46, and then 46 and 19, you can look at it as 65, a 25, 20, and then 19. However, whichever way you want to look at that. Does that make sense to people then? So when we look at this, you can see that um, even though it doesn't, this one doesn't have the 2,604, you can see if I have 19 at the end and I have 65 at the other end, then that's going to be 84. 19 over here, right? And then 65 over here. Added to the 2520 is 84. I could do it the other way. 65 over here, 19 over here, added to the 2520 is 2604. So 84. So 84, 65 plus 19 is 84 plus. Okay, makes sense. So when we look at Isaiah chapter 7, did you see that? Did I share my screen properly? I'm just going to go back here. So this is this. So there's this chart. So I showed you this, right? Or did I not? You did. Okay. So then when I go back to, anyway, go back here to Isaiah chapter 7. We can see then that the start of this, we have the 65 years. But there's there's no way that I can just use this by itself. I have to take. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child can know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. This has to be about the 65 years. And, and when Ephraim is broken, it has to be when it's forsaken of its king, when Hoshea is taken captive. And for Judah, that has to be when Manasseh is taken captive. Especially since the child that's going to be born, he's going to learn to refuse the evil and choose the good. And he has to be of the house of David, right? Because this is a message to the house of David. And if it refers to Christ, ultimately, it has to refer, first refer to one of the house of David. If it was just Isaiah's son through his wife, is Isaiah of the house of David? Is he a king of, in, in Israel? No. Right? No, he's not. Yeah. So he's not of the house of David. Um, so it can't be about his son. Maher Shalah Hashbaz, right? Can't be about him. It has to be about a king that's going to be born. Now we know that the Jews try to apply to Hezekiah, but Hezekiah is already born at this time. So, so it can't be about Hezekiah, but it would be about Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. And so Manasseh is of the house of David. And that's what the prophecy is about. 
So when we go to chapter eight and we deal with Mahershala Hashbaz, his Isaiah already has a son, and we're going to we're going to assume that Isaiah has not does not have multiple wives, and that this wife that he has, this prophetess, who she's he's going to have a son by, um, would already have had a son named uh, Shergesha, right? Shergesha would be very young. Because Isaiah is fairly young. Um, you know, he, he ministers, he's, he's a prophet for a very long time. So, so he had to have been fairly young when he became a prophet. How old exactly? I don't know. But, so his son, Shergesha, would be fairly young when they go to the laundromat there to meet with Ahaz. Um, so he would have had it by the same wife. So Mahershala Hashbaz cannot be the same as the son that's promised to the house of David. Okay. Now, remember, we have these symbols here. So we looked at this um, yesterday. And we know that um, all of these events that are happening here, there, they all have prophetic significance. Uh, for this entire prophecy. So not just for the 65 years, they're symbolizing the whole prophetic mirror. And that's why Mahershala Hashbaz, the prophecy regarding him is going to be written on a mirror. It's not written on a piece of paper or on stone. It's written on a mirror. So it shows that this is about a prophetic mirror. And then we have the king of the north and the king of the south. So, When we look at the king of the north in this history, in this civil war, the king of the north is confederate, right? And we know in at the end of the prophetic mirror, the confederacy is is in the south. And we know that's part of a characteristic of a mirror at times is that they can reflect opposites. So now when we get to Isaiah 8.8, and we spend some time looking at 2 Chronicles, um, there is an invitation that's made, right, in Second Chronicles to northern Israel. Now, this is, of course, in the first year of Hezekiah, right? So we go here. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old and reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah and his daughter, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the, the Lord, right? according to all that David, his father, had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So they're going to be opening on the first day of the first month. So that's going to be in the spring. And the priests and the Levites are going to cleanse this temple. Now, we we had some question about how we understand this, because the way that Jeff understood it is... Uh, the priest clean, clean, cleanse the house for eight days and, and then the Levites for eight days. But we're going to read this here, what it says. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, hear me, ye Levites, and sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. And carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So here, um, just says Kodesh. It's not going to be, it's not going to say most holy place or anything. It's just the holy place, Kadesh. Now the most holy place is called Kadesh HaKodeshim, the holy of holies. And, and the holy is usually we're just either referring to the sanctuary itself or sometimes to just the first compartment. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch, put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. So they have basically shut down the worship in the sanctuary. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, 
and he hath delivered them to trouble and to astonishment and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Okay. Now, um, now it's talking about them being in captivity. Now, are they in captivity in the time of Hezekiah? Because this talking about the captivity of anything. Okay. Is there a captivity that has begun? Yes. Okay. Where did the captivity begin? In, in, cause remember, this is going to be, it's going to be before the fall of Samaria, you know, a couple of years before Hoshea is taken captive. So why is he saying that our wives are in captivity? Our daughters, our sons, lo, our fathers have fallen with the sword. Our sons, our daughters, and our wives are in captivity for this. Remember, he's talking about Judah, too. Didn't the captivity begin when they had chosen to reject the theocracy and wanted the monarchy? Okay, so, well, they're not in captivity to Assyria, and they're not in captivity to Babylon. But they're in captivity to self. Okay, but their wives and their sons and the daughters are in captivity. So why is he saying that? Well, if we go to Second Chronicles 28, verse 5, um, wherefore the Lord, his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him and carried away the great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. So this captivity here is a captivity referring to Syria. Right. So in this period, in this civil war, there is a captivity that goes on. For Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, the mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maaseiah, the king's son, etc. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So this captivity here is the captivity to Samaria. Now, why is this important? Because if their wives and their sons and daughters are in captivity to Samaria, is this after the fall of Samaria or before? Could it be possible that after the fall, because Edwin Thiel says that this all happens after Samaria has been destroyed. But would that be true if Samaria was destroyed, that their, their sons, daughters, and their wives were captive in Samaria. It couldn't possibly be true. So if they're in captivity to northern Israel, right, and Syria, then, then that's because of what happened in that civil war. That would have been, you know, roughly 17 years earlier. You know, it could be about much as, you know, 15 years, maybe, just because of the, the length of that civil war when they're carried captive. OK, so this is some recent event. And so there's no way that you could take this um, statement when Judah is defeated in the time of Ahaz. Right. So this is going to be the time of Ahaz and Pekah. Right? So if you read this chapter, when you get to chapter 29 and Hezekiah after Ahaz dies, Hezekiah becomes the king of Israel. He's going to restore the worship of God and refer to this captivity. Right. And so um, we go on. So. Um, and now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce, fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. Then the Levites arose, and Mahath, the son of Amasiah, and Joel, the son of Ezariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Merarah, and Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehaliah, of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zimnah, and Eden, the son of Joah, and of the sons of Elizaphan, 
Shimri, etc. So all these different people. They gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. Now, it's going to mention uh, uh, when you count the Levites, you got Mahath, Amasiah, Joel, Azariah, and then of the Kohathites, of the sons of Moriah, Kish, the son of Abdi, so Kish, Azariah, uh, Joah, Eden, um, and then you got of the sons of Elizaphan, Shimri, Jael, of the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, Mataniah, the sons of Heman, Jehul, and Shimei, of the sons. I'm trying to figure out how many there are here. Sons of Amasai. So Joel. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think it's 14, but I'd have to count it again. And I have to read this more carefully. Um, but they're going to be the ones that are going to sanctify themselves. And... Um, and the priest, it says, went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. So this is going to be the most holy place. They brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. Right. So the priests are going to do that. The Levites then are going to take this and put it in the brook Kydron. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month, came they to the porch of the Lord. So what's the porch of the Lord? Would that be the entrance into the sanctuary? Yeah, I would think that's the entrance into the sanctuary, right? So it's not the the border between the holy and the most holy place. Um, And then it says, um, so they're going to do this in 16 days. So we, we know that the priests are going to be cleansing the most holy place, and the Levites obviously don't go in there. Um, so the inner part of the house I would take as the most holy place. So you see here. So it says here in the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, the priests and Levites cleanse first the courts, both of the priests and of the people. On this labor, they spent eight days. Then they cleanse the interior of the temple. But as the Levites had no right to enter the temple, the priests carried all the dirt and rubbish to the porch, whence they were collected by the Levites, carried away and cast into the brook Kybert. So this is um, the the translators. This is what this treasury of scripture knowledge is. This is their comment. In this work, eight more days were occupied, and thus the temple was purified in 16 days. So that's how they look at it. But I'm not sure if I get that from reading this. So it says right at the beginning, the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court and the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it abroad and broke Kydra. And they began on the first day of the first month. And the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch. So it seems to me that they're going to clean the porch or clean the temple itself, the sanctuary itself, in eight days. And the house of the Lord in eight days, in the 16th day. So I'm not really sure how we would understand this. It seems to me a little bit obscure on how they're writing this. So, I mean, different commentators are going to have different opinions. So eight days they cleared and cleansed the temple, and eight days more the courts of the temple. That's the way that I would understand it. So it's not eight days to cleanse the most holy place and eight days to cleanse the holy place. The, the priests and the Levites are working together. They take eight days to cleanse the temple and then eight more days to clean up everything else. So it says, they went into Hezekiah the king and said, we have cleansed all the house of the Lord. So that would have happened in eight days. And the altar of burnt offering and all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified. And behold, 
they are before the altar of the Lord, right? And then we know that Hezekiah is going to, he's going to do some offerings, right? And then, so there's some sin offerings, bulls, goats, things like that. And we go here. So it's going to be in the next chapter that you're going to have this invitation. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel from his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. But they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even unto Dan, that they should come keep the Passover unto, unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done of it a long time in such sort as it was written. So we know that this invitation is an important invitation. Now, it's not at the beginning of the Civil War, but it's prior to the end of the 19 years for northern Israel. So their sons and their daughters and their wives are captive in northern Israel. So northern Israel exists. So Edwin Thiel's chronology cannot work here. Um, Because he's going to have, of course, Hezekiah become king 10 years after the destruction of Samaria, which makes no sense. But contradicts the Bible plainly. So we have this um, invitation. So this invitation, does it parallel any invitation in our time? So if we look at it as a prophetic mirror, can we see how the beginning, prior to the beginning of the 2520 for Israel, that that's going to mirror what happens after the 2520 for Israel in the proclamation of the three angels' messages? Is that clear? That's something to consider. So we can see there's a parallel and there's a cleansing of the temple that occurs, right? So that cleansing of the temple must typify the cleansing of the temple that happens after. But notice the temple gets cleansed first. Then the invitation is made. And then the 2520 for Israel is going to begin. In the mirror side of it, then you're going to have the invitation and that's going to precede the cleansing of the temple, not follow it in the three angels' messages. So you can see how that prophetic mirror uh, works and operates. So just when, when we just deal with that part of the prophetic mirror for, nor, for, uh, for what's happening with northern Israel in this invitation, because they represent the Protestants, Right. And at the end, in 1798, the Protestants are given this invitation. It's going to happen through Miller, under the first angel's message. Okay, and then and then when the second angel's message begins, that's going to be for those that had accepted that first call. So, so there's definitely a parallel there or a mirror in that context. Um, so it says the post went with the letters from the king his and his princes throughout Israel and Judah according to the commandment of the king saying ye children of Israel turn again that word is going to be shuv right unto the Lord God of Abraham Isaac and Israel and he will return again shuv uh, to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. So we know that northern Israel does have a type of captivity that happens to Assyria itself. That is because um, when Assyria it, uh, conquers northern Israel, that is, uh, you're going to have uh, a Pekka and then you're going to have um uh, the king of Syria, um, uh, reason, right? 
So they're going to have this conspiracy. And, 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 and when the king of Assyria uh, comes, he doesn't really help Ahaz. I mean, he does in a sense because he helps end that conspiracy, but he also uh, spoils Judah as well, right? So, so Judah isn't really free. So the king of Assyria is beginning to assert uh, his authority over northern Israel. But it's not going to be until a couple of years later that the king of Assyria is going to take Hoshea captive and then two years after that destroy Samaria. And then uh, 46 years after that, it's going to repopulate um, is is how under S.R. Hayden, he's going to be the one uh, that's going to repopulate northern Israel. And be not ye like your fathers and like your children, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as ye see. Now be ye not stiff-necked, and as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Right? So he, he gives this warning, and it says, So the post passed from city to city, uh, through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, that they laughed him to scorn and mocked him. Nevertheless, a diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of the God, hand of God was upon, was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled in Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for incense took they away and cast them into the brook Hydron. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in the place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God and the priests sprinkled the blood which they received at the hand of the Levites. Okay, so so we're going to know for a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and of Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet they did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one. And that prepared his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. So there's obviously something there that we should be able to see as well. But anyway, our time is up. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, I thank you for the study today, for all this review and these details that we uh, need to bring to mind and bring us together again to study uh, according to thy word and um, thy will. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.